We're still in our uh, series in Johannine Epistles. Today we're going to talk about the light. God is light. We finished last time about 1 John 1, 1 to 4. And we've learned the prologue or the introduction of the letter or track or sermon of John for the people or the church in Ephesus. Okay, all right? The church in Ephesus, there are different churches in Ephesus. There are Paul, Pauline churches, there are Johannine churches. These are Johannine churches in Ephesus. Pauline means Paul's churches that he established. And we are talking about here also in Ephesians, in Ephesus, or not Ephesians, Ephesus, those are people who've been evangelized by John, who read this gospel of John. All right, we've learned, yes, last week, that the writer of First John, Second John, and Third John is also the writer of the gospel of John. He is John the Beloved. John the Apostle, the son of Sivity, okay, the brother of James, okay. We've also learned last week that uh, we can have this complete joy. And this, what, you're, what you're seeing right now in front of you, this is the manifestation of complete joy. Not, the absence, not in the absence of sadness and sorrow, but this is in the presence of God. This is the fullness of joy. We can have complete joy as we have learned last time because the, of we have a life in God. We have a relationship with God and we have fellowship with God and that thing, with those things could give us complete joy. That's the very reason why John said in verse 4 last week that he wrote it in order for us to have a complete joy. Okay? And today, we're going to learn from verse 5 to 10. Let's start with verse 10. 5 that says, first part, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. Come on, you've been hearing this from John. He's so adamant to preach. He's so passionate about preaching and declaring what he heard, what he saw, what he felt, what he touched. He is a credible author, a writer of a letter. He is credible because he's a first-hand eyewitness. Remember, in the first few verses that says, we saw it, we heard it, and we touch him. And we declare it to you. We proclaim it to you. Why? Why was John was so adamant in preaching and declaring and proclaiming to this Ephesians church about the truth of Jesus, about the truth of God. Because without truth, you cannot really have this fullness of joy. Remember the very reason why John wrote this first John is, if you could still remember, he wrote this for a particular group of people in Ephesus. It's because He's trying to correct. He's trying to combat false teachers. Do you still remember that last week? And what, that, what type of group is that? The Gnostics, the Gnosticism. The Gnosticism is a group of people who believe that matter is evil, spirit is good, right? So they're trying to say that Jesus is not really human when he came here. Yes, Jesus is God, but he's not human. Why? Because human is a matter. Matter is evil. Therefore, Jesus cannot be human. If Jesus is human, therefore, he is evil. So we only believe Jesus as God, but not human. But we believe, we firmly believe as Christians that Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100%, 100% human. How could I explain it? It's difficult. It is hard. But it's in the Bible. It imp the Bible imp implies that God is 100% human, 100% 100, 100 God. And that's the thing that John was trying to combat. That's why he decided to write the letter of 1 John. 
I am writing this to combat, to correct these false teachers. They're trying to destroy. They're trying to, to, to disturb no? to this, these people in the church in Ephesus. Mm, there's a humming sound. They're trying to combat this. Okay, so you know the scenario. You will, you will keep on hearing this thing to me because the whole letter of epistle of John, that's what they're trying, that's the letter, that's what the letter is trying to, to do. It's specifically written to a group of people, not necessarily to us, but us who has the letter right now, we are trying to get the principle out of it and apply it into our lives, in our context, in our generation, and in our story. This is their story. But we could be in that story by learning the background of the story and the context. Okay? So you're getting me, church. All right? So you're learning now. And we're going to get the practical application of this one. Of all this theology, of all this background that you're hearing, it would make sense. You would see this. You would see this. All right? So imagine this group of people. Trying to stir the hearts of these people in church. Oh, your God, the gospel of John is not right. Jesus is just a phantom. He's ghost. He's not a real human. But how could Jesus die for us, for our sins, if Jesus is not human? Those are Gnostics. This belief was uh, started from Plato in the early, uh, before Christ, 250 to 350 BC. That because Plato, this philosophy, then this religion or this group of people, this belief, was the one that really stirred churches in the first centuries, first, second, and third centuries. This Gnosticism, this Gnostics. Gnosis means knowledge or to know from the Greek word. You have to have special knowledge in order for you to get the knowledge of God and understand and to be spiritual in order for you to be Good. If you want to be good, then you have to, have, you have to acquire this special knowledge that these Gnostics are saying. If you have this knowledge, then you are Gnostics. Then you don't believe that, God, that Jesus is human and God. So let's do this. This is the message that I heard from him. This is not a made-up story. This is something that John heard, saw, touched. And he's trying to tell it to the Ephesian churches. And this is what I'm trying to echo to you right now. And let it echo in your mind. Let it reverberate in your mind. God, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is human. Jesus is human. What? Why is that important, Pastor Jim? Why do you keep on telling that? We're trying to because it was being repeated and amplified by John again and again and again in this book. You've heard it from chapter one, you're going to see it again in chapter two, in chapter three. Because that's how he wrote the letter. He's trying to amplify what he already said in the Gospel of John. And here you go. He said, You we have heard from him and proclaim to you now. He's proclaiming it to you. What, Pastor June? That God is light. And that's the message for today. God is light. Yes, God is light. You may be here today. I've heard that before. Oh. So what? God is light. God is light means he illuminates. He reveals. He exposes. He is glorious. He is pure. Because God is light. Because God is light. Let's start reading. It says there, that there is no darkness in the light. In verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Because God is light, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness... If we say that we have fellowship in him, church, this is in reference to the previous verses onto the context of combating or correcting the Gnostics 
because the Gnostics, those saying that matter is evil and spirit is God is good, they're trying to say that they have fellowship with God. He's trying, remember, he's trying to correct the Gnostics, he's trying to correct the false teachers. You're getting me here? Are you following? He says here, if we say, if you say, you Gnostics, you, you're trying to say that you have fellowship with God while you are walking in darkness, while you're steering up the church, while you are going out of the church, leaving the church, you're saying that you have fellowship with God? There's a double life here. There's a hint of double life here. They're saying that they are these, these Gnostics, these false teachers, they're trying to divide the church, trying to, trying to steer the church. They're saying that they have fellowship with God while they were still walking in darkness. That's not right. You cannot walk or live a double life. If you have fellowship with God, you cannot walk in darkness because in, dark, in God's light, there is no darkness at all. You get, do you get what I'm saying here, church? If you say that you are walking in the light, you are with the light, you are fellowshipping with the light, therefore you should not be walking in darkness. Walking here is not just mere walk, but this is a life. It is a style of living, walking in darkness. But because of these trials, problems that's being being drawn to these churches during the time, they have the tendency to commit sins, to disobey God, to, to fight God because they're following a wrong doctrine, wrong belief. That's why they had this tendency to live in darkness. See, the last phrase that says, we lie and do not do, not do what is true. The important thing is the truth. That's the very reason why John was trying to teach the truth. Telling them from the very first four verses, the prologue, which is Jesus is the life, eternal life, that he is the word of life, that he has the fellowship with us and Father, Son. That's the truth. Without the truth, we cannot completely experience the fullness of joy. That's why even we are surrounded by darkness, sins of this world. If we have fellowship with God, there's no darkness at all in our lives. Even though people around us, they're already committing sins, terrible sins. If you have fellowship with God, we could say still that we are walking in the light. That we are in the light because we know the truth. That the truth is Jesus is God. Jesus is human. Jesus is the eternal life. Jesus is the word of life. That's what John was teaching and trying to repeat it again and again in order for them to understand it. So there is no darkness in the light. Even though you think that your life is surrounded Top, bottom, side, right side, left side, with darkness, with pressures, trials, sufferings in life. If you have fellowship with God, you are still in the light. That's why diamonds, they are placed in a black velvet. If you're going to find it, find them in the stores or jewelry stores. In order for the diamond to be magnified. I'm not, going, I'm not into jewelers or diamond, but if you know diamond, they normally place or position in a black velvet in order for that diamond to be magnified. Just like the God. If we are with God, even though we are surrounded with darkness, if we are fellowshipping with God, our lives will just be magnified and people around us will see our light. We will see our glaring light right that's why if you're going to ask me how are you pastor june during these past few days i have a fellowship with god and while i fellowship with god there is no darkness yes i am surrounded with darkness in this world we cannot avoid darkness but we continue to fellowship with God. 
you read the word of God, you pray, you serve, you continue what you're doing. You don't wallow in the darkness. You don't just sit down there and just continue licking your wounds. No, church. You have to fellowship with God in order for you to experience the light that God likes us to experience. Because with God, it is very clear. In Him, there is no darkness at all. If you are fellowshipping with God, there is no darkness at all. You might receive bad reports. You might receive some negative things around you. But if you are continue, you're continue fellowshipping with God, there is no darkness at all. Yes, you are surrounded. Come on, no matter how dark is that room is, if there is one light, that light will shine. And that's God. So in Him, there's no darkness at all. Isn't that great? The experience... Are, do you, are you overwhelmed right now with your darkness? Are you? Check your fellowship with God. If you see yourself being overwhelmed, I think you have a problem with your fellowship with God. You don't have a problem with your relationship with God. Your relationship cannot be affected. You'll always be the son or the child of God or the daughter of God, but your fellowship can be affected. Let's continue. So there's no darkness at all. Anna, can you put in this? Yeah, there you go. There's no darkness in the light. Therefore, we have to walk in the light. This is what verse 7 tells us. It says, but if we walk in the light as he himself in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Wow, praise God. If we are walking in the light, it means we have fellowship with one another. Okay? So people who cannot fellowship with God cannot fellowship with Christians. Do you get it? If we walk in the light as he who is he, God. If we fellowship with God, we walk with God in the light. As he himself in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Two Christians, if I fellowship with God and you fellowship with God, we could have fellowship with one another. Remember, fellowship here is not just, in, just, a, not a, not, it's not just an ordinary word that we use here in our normal language. It is a koinonia, means you have this oneness, unity, loving, sharing. You have one purpose. If you're going, go, if you're going to go deeper, the koinonia or the fellowship of God, the Father, Son, and the Spirit is the theological word that says perichoresis. We will go there again, the fellowship of God, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. It is so deep. They are co-equal. They coexist, and they cannot be divided and separate. That's why they're... They're, they're united, their purpose, their actions are one. Therefore, that's the thing, that's the fellowship that I am referring here. It doesn't mean that you are in that life group, that you are fellowshipping with the life group if you are not fellowshipping with God. Do you hear me, church? It doesn't mean that you are with your Pakuranga life group. If you are not fellowshipping God, you are not really fellowshipping with the people in that group. So now, you're looking at yourself in this text. If I am not fellowshipping with God, I don't have anything to do with you. If we together, for example, me and Maggie, we cannot love one another, we fight one another, there's a problem. Because we don't have the right relationship with God. We don't have fellowship with the light. We are not walking in the light. But if I have a right relationship with God, if I am walking in the light, and Maggie is walking in the light, it's easy for us. It's automatic. It is just normal for us to fellowship because we have one heart. We have God as our denominator in us. So it doesn't mean that you are in this church if you don't have a right fellowship with God, if you are not walking in the light of God, 
Sorry to tell. You're just here because you want to. But the true fellowship, you cannot really have a true fellowship with the people of God. It is hard, but it's true. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. What could be the hindrance? What could be the deterrent? Why we cannot fellowship with one another or why we cannot walk with God or we cannot walk together side by side as Christians? What would be the reason behind it? I'm sure it would be sin. That's why it says there, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sins. In order for us to truly walk with God, walk in the light, walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need the blood of Jesus that would cleanse us from all sins because sins is the very thing that interrupts us from our fellowship, from our walk with God and walking with another, envy, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, lust of the flesh, angers, this greed. I don't know what have you here, but those things could stop us from, from fellowshipping with one another as brothers and sisters and even fellowshipping with God. That's why we need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us in order for us to continue walking in the light. If we walk in the light, we also walk in fellowship with my brothers and sisters. If I walk in the light and Jerry would walk in the light with pure heart, there is no problem. I could say that we are both walking in the light of God. Walk in the light. Pastor June, you don't know what I did last Sunday. I mess up. I think God can no longer forgive me. If you only see, Pastor John, what I have done last month, last year, or when I was young, it was a terrible thing. I don't think God will not forgive me. Is there any person in this room who has a doubt that God cannot forgive you by his blood? What would take away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not the music. Not the preaching of Pastor June. Not the prayer of your prayer warriors. Not your money. Not your best friend. Not your husband. No one could take away your sins. But only by the blood of Jesus. I don't care what you did. I don't care what kind of sins. I don't care what kind of transgressions in your life that you have committed. But as long as there's the blood of Jesus... That is enough to forgive us. I am good with that. Do you all believe here that your sins are forgiven and it's actually taken away? It is because of the blood of Jesus. In the same way that God can forgive you, in the same manner that God can forgive the person who hurt you. All right, we fine. we're fine. We accept that, Pastor June. That the grossest sins that I've committed, God can forgive that. But do you believe that the person who hurt you the most, I don't know that kind of act he did, God would also forgive that person because of the blood of Jesus so that we can have Fellowship. Fellowship is one of the themes of Epistle of John. So that we could walk in the light as we walk together in the light. So walk in the light. But you cannot walk in the light if there's no blood of Jesus. That's why we all need the light. Let's go back there for a while. See? But if we walk in the light as he himself in the light, he's also referring to these Gnostics, to these false teachers that's saying that they are walking in the light, but they are not walking in the light. See, that those ifs that we are re reading, those are referring to those Gnostics, those false teachers that he's trying to, to combat, to correct with this letter. Here, we need the light. If we say that we have no sin, he was referring to, Paul, John was referring to whom? To the Gnostics, to the false teacher who's trying to divide the church, who already left the church, and also some people already still in the church who were already, uh, uh, who believed 
those Gnostics, those who left the church but still in the church. And Paul was trying to correct them, saying, if we say that we have no sin, if you say you Gnostics, if you say who those who believe in Gnostic system, if you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourselves. You see the story? You see the backdrop? He's trying, John was trying to, to combat, to correct those Gnostics. Here you go. They're trying to say that they don't, they don't sin. Why? Because they already achieved the sinless perfection. Because we already have the spirit. Because of our knowledge, special knowledge that we already acquired, gnosis, to know or knowledge in Greek. We already received that. Again, what's the two premise of this Gnosticism? Matter is evil, spirit is good. They already received the spirit. That's why they're good. That they're no longer, they can no longer commit sins. See what I mean here? If you say that you do not sin, you really need the light. Why? Because you don't see yourself. As if you face your mirror every day, and you see a speck, you see a dirt in your face, but you say, no, I don't have any dirt in my face. Bye for now, I'll go to work. That's you. Because all of us, we need the light in order for us to be illuminated in order for us, for our sins to be exposed. Because the light exposes, the light reveals. And God will reveal to you your transgressions, your iniquities, your sins, your failures, your weaknesses. We don't see those things sometimes because we are clouded by the things of this world if you say you have not seen, or if you say you already achieved the sinless perfection, you're deceiving yourselves. The worst thing that could happen to a person is to come to a point in your life that you're already deceiving yourself. It's fine sometimes. It's already painful to be, to, to be deceived by someone. But to deceive yourself? Come on. That's another thing. If you say you don't have sins, you're deceiving yourself. And the truth is not in us. Again, truth. That's why John was trying to teach him the truth about Jesus, the truth about God, about the love of God, about the life in God, about the fellowship in God, about the relationship in God, about the blood of Jesus that can cleanse us from all our sins. That's, that's, those are the truth. We need the truth in order for us to be set free. If we confess our sins, confession is not just admitting that you sin. Confession is an active thing. You have to act and ask for God's forgiveness. If we confess our sins, we have to come to God and admit and confess and ask for forgiveness and seek God. If we confess our sins... He who is faithful and just. I'm so excited about this little praise. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful. It would be wrong for Jesus to withhold forgiveness for each and every one of us. Because He is faithful. The Word of God tells us that He is faithful from the very beginning, from Genesis to Revelation. You could sense and you could read and you could understand. You would learn that God is faithful. In Hebrew it says, the one who promised is faithful. But sometimes you cannot experience the faithfulness of God because sins are covering your life. But if you confess your sins, you would experience His faithfulness. I'm not saying that God stopped being faithful. It's just that we are faithless. We don't believe about God's faithfulness. We don't believe about His truth. That's why we don't experience, we don't feel, we don't sense His faithfulness. But the truth is, God's faithfulness is constant. It will never change. There you go. If you confess your sins, He is faithful. He is faithful to His promises to your life. Last 10 years ago, last 5 years ago, God promised you something. He is faithful. 
Even to those who broke the covenant relationship with him in the past, in Old Testament, he remained faithful. Those who abandoned God, those who rejected God, he remained faithful to them. And that's our assurance that God will forgive us because he is faithful. And it would be wrong for God not to forgive you. Because that's his very nature. It would be wrong for God not to fulfill his promise to your life because he claimed that he is faithful. The God who promised is faithful. And not only that, if you confess your sins, he is just. If you have other translations, it says righteousness. But I would like to take this word just from the word justice. God is not just faithful to you. He is also just in forgiving you. He is just. He serves equality. He is not, he doesn't show any favoritism. And it says in the Bible, because God is just, he would reward you. If he won't reward you, he is unjust. If he will not fulfill his promise to you, therefore God is unjust. But he is just. Right? Because God is just. Let me, let me go back to my notes. There you go. Oh, thank you, Lord. When we say God is just, we mean that he is perfectly righteous in his treatment. Not just for me, but to all his creations. God shows no partiality, it says in Acts 10.34. He commands any, he commands against the mistreatment of others. If one is being mistreated, that's not just. If God won't deal those mistreatments, then he is unjust. If you are being mistreated, God will rescue you because God is the God of justice. Right? He commands against that mistreatment. He's perfect. He perfectly executes vengeance. He is the one who's going to give vengeance against your oppressors. And God is not unjust not to do that. And you know what? God is just. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you have helped people con continuously. That's right. It's Hebrews 6.10. And he's equal, equally just meeting out punishments. Oh, because God is just. He would punish sins. You know where I'm going now? If God will not punish sins, then he is unjust. For example, you were in a court. You sued someone who murdered your family. And there you go, the guy who murdered your whole, your entire family. And the judge says, I know what you did. You murdered the entire family. And the judge would get his gavel, gable and then hit. Bam. I know what you did. You murdered everyone. Not guilty. What would you feel? Where is the justice of that God? That's not justice. There's no justice on that. The justice, there should be a penalty for the murder. But the judge says, not guilty. Come on. This is not the God that we serve. He murdered my entire family. But this judge would say, not guilty. The judge, in order for him to be just, he has to penalize the guilty person. And what the judge would do, he would send his son in place of that murderer. Okay, you're not guilty. Let my son receive your penalty. Let him go to jail, or if he have a uh, death penalty, let my son die 
on that penalty. That's justice. Because God is love. He needs to satisfy himself. Because in the Old Testament, in order for you to satisfy God, in order for you not to be penalized with your sin, you have to take bull, ram, sheep, unblemished sheep. But once and for all, God, because he is just, he is loving, he doesn't want people to perish. He doesn't want any of you to perish and receive the penalty of sin and death. What is the penalty of sin? Death. Romans says, for the wages of sin is death. In order for me to fulfill my faithfulness and justice, I need to satisfy the condition I need to give my own son, Jesus, to die on that cross. We need light. And that's for us. That's for us who are saying we don't have, we do not sin. You sin, come on. We all have sin. But thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, that you are just. You are a liar, Lord. If you will not forgive me today, it only takes your step of faith to reach out to God and tell him that you need light. In every day of our life, we need light in order for us to be exposed not with people, not in public, to expose ourselves, to expose us in front of God and see ourselves in the light. Do you get it, church? There you go. And He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's because of the light that exposed us, that purifies us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Again, the truth, the word, the precepts, the law of God is not in us. Not the law. I don't want to use the word law. Just the word. The truth of God is not in us. Again, he went back to the word truth. We have to know the truth because the truth will set us free. The truth that God is fully human, fully God. He's the eternal life. He's the word of life. That he has a fellowship. He, he wanted to fellowship with us, with God the Son, God the Spirit, and God the Father. And that's the truth. And we need to know about that. Wrong Theology, wrong concept, wrong truth about God would lead you to wrong actions, to wrong thinking, to wrong character. So what I'm saying here is we need light. God is light. There is no darkness at all. Fellowship with God. Walk with God. If you don't want to experience, or if you don't want to be overwhelmed with darkness, walk in the light. So that we could walk together in the light. If we are both walking in the light, we can walk together as Christians in our life group, in this church, in our family, in our, in our small groups. And then we need the light daily because light cleanses us. Light can expose our sins and that would make us continue walking in the light. God is light. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we all stand, church? Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for letting us know that you are indeed light. And in the light, there is no darkness at all. We may, we may be surrounded by darkness all over around us. Darkness here, darkness there. But God, thank you that you are the light and in the light there is no darkness at all we might be straight we might be dark the darkness might be overwhelming lord thank you that you are more than enough hallelujah jesus thank you god thank you lord and god is asking you and inviting you to receive the light that he is offering right now if you confess your sins, 
He is faithful and just. You would experience His faithfulness. You would appreciate His faithfulness and His justice if you would confess your sins. Many times, Lord, many times, we don't appreciate, we don't experience, we don't feel your justice and your faithfulness because of our sins. And right now, we would like to set this thing straight to you. God, may it be big, may it be small. We ask for forgiveness. Thank you, God, that you are faithful. You would forgive us and purify us from all our unrighteousness. Thank you, God. If you are here today, you are new to this church, you're, you're here with us for so long and still you don't experience the light or maybe for the very first time you are there in front of your gadget or your computer or your TV, television watching us online if you would like to experience the light of God I'm inviting you right now to pray this prayer with me this is a prayer of accepting Jesus as the light into your heart into your life that you may live that you may walk in the light if it is you repeat this prayer with me Jesus thank you for the gift of life Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of eternal life. Right now, I come to you. I acknowledge my sinfulness. I believe that I have sinned. And today, I would like to confess all my sins. I believe that you died for those sins. And you rose back to life for that sins and thank you Lord your blood is more than enough and I would like to invite you into my life come into my heart be my Lord be my God be my Savior in Jesus name Amen Amen if you pray that prayer start reading your Bible start coming to church regularly if you're there online find a church online physical church where you could serve and where you could walk with others in the light. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you.